I think critical thinking, creativity, the ability to figure out what other people want, the ability to have new ideas, that, in some sense, that, that'll be the most valuable skill of the future. If you think of a world where every one of us has a whole company worth of AI assistants that are doing tasks for us to help us express our vision and um, make things for other people and make these new things in the world, the most important thing then will be the quality of the ideas, um, the curation of the ideas, because AI can generate lots of great ideas, but you still need a human there to say this is the thing other people want. And also humans, I think, really care about the human behind something. So when I read a, bo a book that I really love, the first thing I want to do is go read about that author. And if an AI wrote that book, uh, I think I'll somehow connect to it much less. Same thing when I look at a great piece of art, or if I am using some company's product, I want to know about the people that, that created that. So I think in both directions of humans knowing what other humans want, and also humans caring about the humans behind something, um, this will be, that'll be a super important skill. Uh, and so I think learning that ability to create, come up with new ideas, choose ideas from among the many options presented by an AI, uh, that'll be very valuable. I agree with you the tools will change, but I also think familiarity with the tools of today and this new way of using computers is really important. And that'll be important for everyone, not just the tool builders, but everybody, like in the same way that if you can't use a mobile phone, you're kind of at a huge disadvantage, but they're not that hard to use and people learn. But the earlier in your career you got familiar with it, the life, the better. You know, everybody in this room was familiar with it probably as long as you can remember. But uh, I, rem I remember watching older people struggle with getting comfortable with a phone for the first time, as intuitive as I thought they were. I, I, I think human adaptability is remarkable. And so I'm very happy that people no longer think it's weird or impressive that we can talk to a computer like we talk to a human and it understands us and it talks back to us and it does things for us. But two years ago, almost no one believed that was gonna be possible anytime soon. You know, two years ago, what happens now with using ChatGPT was the stuff of sci-fi at best. And if you told the world this was gonna be part of people's daily lives two years later, I think they would have said, of course not, you know, that's, that's a Hollywood thing. And this is a significant change the world has just gone through. Um, I think this is probably, well, certainly this is the most significant change to how we use computers since the touch screens on mobile phones. Um, but I think it'll probably be much, much bigger than that. You'll be able to just say it, tell a computer, like you would tell a friend or an employee, I need this thing to happen, or what do you think about this, or can you help me out with this, or how do you think about this? And it'll just do it for increasingly complex definitions of it. You know, right now it can maybe like write some code for you, edit a paper for you, uh, you know, help you analyze things, but someday it'll write a whole program for you. Uh, do a whole research project for you, help you come up with new ideas, uh, someday not in the far future. So I think it's a very big deal. Yeah. If I could just follow up, uh, uh, <clears throat> last week, relative to ChatGPT, where are we in, as, as a society? And almost to a person, it was believed that we are at a transformative time. Yeah. We are at a transformative time because it's so easy for everyone to use. Whether you're a STEM person or a humanities person, you're a housewife, whether you're a middle schooler. And, 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 and so uh, our father is that we're at a transformative moment, almost like when the internet was, in, in, was introduced. Would you want to comment on that? One of, so I'll answer it in two parts. First of all, uh, I agree about the magnitude of this transformation because what is happening is we are going from a world in which intelligence is limited and expensive to abundant and cheap. And if you think about how much any of you could do if you had a massive amount of cognitive labor at your disposal to build the ideas you wanna see happen, to be useful to other people, to provide services and advice. Um, you know, right now you can hire people and you can coordinate them and it's kind of difficult and very expensive and most people in the world cannot afford nearly as much, let's call it cognitive service as they'd like. Um, you know, not many people can afford great lawyers, for example. That's a very specialized, very expensive kind of cognitive service. If the cost of that, the availability of that comes down by a factor of 100 
or a factor of 10,000. And not just for legal advice, because I don't think anyone needs like lots more legal back and forth, but for all the stuff we do want, great entertainment, great products and services, everything else, great education, great medical care. Uh, that is a profound shift to the world. So we're super excited about that. And I think that everyone can feel what the magnitude of that transformation looks like. Your second point is actually not a question that I've been asked many times, and I think it's a great one, so I appreciate it. Um, one of the things that I learned at YC, uh, Y Common Air, and also what I learned as I was like a kid studying the history of technology, is you can never go too far making a technology easy to use and accessible. Um, every, you know, every like 10% easier to use, you can make a technology maybe twice as many people use it or they use it twice as much or there's this huge thing. And so we had this technology that we knew was pretty cool. We didn't know quite how much people were gonna like it, but we had a sense they were. And we put it out first in an API and like some nerds had a good time with it, but not very many. And it was kind of like unknown in the world. We put, we put GPT-3 out in the API. I think it was in like June, maybe it was July of 2020, 2020 something like that. Uh, and you know, people built stuff and other, but we started thinking then about like, what is, what is the best, simplest, most natural user interface that we can build on this? And I'd had this observation that computers had trended over time um, to be as close to the way we interact with other humans or we interact with with our physical world as as possible. So you started out with like punch cards to program computers. I don't know how those people did it. It sounds amazing to me. Like what an unnatural way to use a computer. And they're like literally like sorting these things out on the floor, wild. But they did it. And then you had command lines and that was like a little better. There's somewhat of like a kind of framework I can see for that, but I'm grateful I never really had to use those computers. And then you have the graphical user interface. And now finally we're getting something towards more like something the way we interact with the world. Uh, and a lot of people started to use it. And we knew how to point at things and the mouse was a reasonable analog for that. The keyboard was kind of fake, but it was like good enough. And this idea that we had these like windows and graphical information displayed to us, like we look at the world, we look at a screen, there were images, that all kind of worked. Uh, the smartphone was then a, a huge revolution we got to get rid of that keyboard and that mouse and just use our hands. Like again, much closer to how we use the world. And so we were thinking about what was next in that and sci-fi had predicted this, so it shouldn't have taken us as long to figure it out as it did. But you really just want a computer you can talk to like you talk to a human. We, have, we are so finely tuned to use language and this, the, the, the nuance and sophistication of language. Um, imprecise though it is, all of the problems with it that it has, we can communicate at a very high bandwidth, enormously complex ideas with language. And so we said, well, what if we just go back to this idea of chatbots? People tried it earlier. The problem was the chatbot didn't really understand you. Maybe now it can. Let's try to build that. And then building the chatbot itself, the chat interface itself is obviously trivial, but the question was, how do we tune the underlying model to be really helpful to you and really good at conversation.